to introduce to you our dynamic Vice President, Devon Woodland. Thank you. Thank you, Orn Lee, for those kind words. <clears throat> the agenda indicates that my time is allotted between 1 and 2, and I want to assure you I'm going to take more time than the clock would allow me, because I have some things that I feel very strongly about and want to visit with you about. I don't know of a period of time in my life when I feel a greater and deeper sense of responsibility than I do at this time. Because of the things which we do, or the things which we may not do, and the effect that it will have upon the lives of thousands of people. There's out there among you, as we see from here, a sea of faces. And among you, there are those that are not sure about the goals of this organization and perhaps your involvement in it. And as this meeting and others continue through the following two days, you're going to make some decisions as to whether or not this movement, this organization is one that you want to affiliate yourself with. Microphone number five. And here, over here. Need more volume on, more, on number five. You're going to be making a decision in this meeting and the ones that follow whether or not you want to become involved in this movement. Let me assure you that I feel deeply that this nation has a divine destiny. And the Constitution was drawn up by men who were inspired by our Maker that this land would be a haven to the homeless and that this organization is going to make and play a very important role in the destiny of this land. And we have come here to chart the course, to outline and map the goals that we're going to pursue, to fill our role in directing the destiny of this land. Now, you have heard it said here today, and not being critical of those who preceded, but I want to comment and help you adjust your thinking somewhat. The indication and the suggestion was that with the new administration, things were going to be better, that 85 percent of parity was the goal and the intentions of those who were in the policymaking positions now. But let me remind you of this, when someone gives you something, they can take it away. And if you earn and attain your goals yourself, they're yours. And so let us not be complacent into thinking that there are those who are going to do for us the thing which needs to be done and because of that, we shorten our stride. Now, I believe, and those that are assembled here as the leadership of our organization, that this is the best land, the best country in the world. We recognize this, the freedoms we enjoy. But they are not free. They must be they were earned, and they must be protected by those of us who are recipients of them. There are those that fought their battles early in the history of this country for us. There has been movements and organizations of people in their endeavors who fought their battles as well. And it just happens that you and I now have one that we must become involved in. The battle that faces us that we must 
embrace and engage ourselves in is to correct this grave injustice that's being thrust upon this segment of society. No others will become involved in it. No others will take the leadership. It must be done by those who are recipients of it. And as we proceed, you will hope, I hope, understand that individually we are as helpless as a newborn babe, that our life as such individually depends entirely on what another would give us, and that we must now take a stand and no longer tolerate that type of philosophy or that type of a system under which we may be forced to organize. The news that NFO brings isn't always good news, but we have a responsibility as the leadership of the organization. And I think that we would be violating that role as leaders if we didn't tell you exactly how we feel and what we see and what we project happening to we in this industry. And I think also the organization would fail in its responsibility if it didn't help design a program for us to accomplish the goals that we have set out to do, and then you would be failing as members of industry, agriculture, this industry, as members of this organization, if you did not apply your abilities. We have had two days preceding this day whereby we discussed in detail we all sat down and with a brain thrust discussion, we compiled and put together thoughts and ideas. And I would hope it doesn't stop with those two days, but that even here today, that someone may say something that will trigger your mind to action. And that an idea may be, or a seed may be planted that we can move more rapidly toward that goal that's there projected ahead of us. Yes, we have the responsibility to talk to our people and tell them the things which we see happening. And it isn't always good news. We have been right in many of the things that we have talked to you about. And sad but true, more often than not, we have been correct in what we saw happening. Years ago, you recall that we talked to you about the CED report. We gave leadership to the exposure of the plan, and we knew then that that plan was a long-range plan, that it wouldn't be accomplished in a few short months or years, but the goal they had would be pursued without regard to the welfare of people. This was driven home to me just the other day as I sat there in the home office and a knock came on the door. And here came two young people from the city of New York. They wanted to visit with those who were directly involved in agriculture production, and we spent some time with them. And they told us that they were writing a book. And they wanted to include in that book all segments as far as agriculture was concerned, and a chapter was going to be dedicated to the, the Agriculture Department, USDA, another to farm credit, another to the consumer-producer relationship, and then another to those who are directly involved in producing. We spent some five hours with them in reviewing, helping them gain information, factual information from NFO, the interesting thing was is they were a consumer philosophy type, and I asked them why their concern for agriculture. And they said that their concern was, and I learned later the same as ours, that those large corporations which controlled many of the industries in this country may eventually get control of the food and fiber plant if not through production, some way get control of the food and fiber. And then they, the consuming public, would be at the mercy of those people. Well, 
they had made their visits to many of the chapters of the book which I mentioned. They had gone to the farm credit people to get their opinion on farm credit. I asked them blankly what it was they had learned. They said, well, very frank, they told us and they had visited with the big banks, New York, Chicago. They said, well, they told us there's still too many farmers out there on the soil. Well, we projected as the goals of the CED was made known to us that they weren't going to stop at the half a million that they talked about, that they would pursue those goals to the limits to where they thought that they had agriculture down 300,000, quarter of a million. And this was brought home by the announcement by these young people. One of them had received their degree in sociology and was teaching at the University of Colorado. Another was an attorney at law with a reputable law firm in Denver. And they had taken a leave of absence to pursue what they felt strongly about. Yes, we recognized that back then, the threat of the corporate agriculture structure, the attempt to invade this industry. And then we also were instrumental in revealing the young executives' report and their goals as they began to invade our domain in this industry. Many other times we'd recognized the dangers, the threat that hovered over you and I as farmers and ranchers. Well, it becomes our responsibility to talk to you very frankly and very firmly about what we see happening so that you may not be misled. I had the opportunity of serving on a panel just recently in one of the universities in the Midwest. And there on that panel was several bankers and professional business people. And as each presented their position, and it was an agriculture discussion, each presented their position as to where we were going in the months and few years ahead, one of the bankers said, in fact, and no one could disagree with him, that farmers will never buy supplies any cheaper than they're buying them today. Tomorrow they will cost more. The next day they will cost more. The point he was making was, is the inflationary spiral and the tendency of farm supplies has no end in sight that they could project or foresee. No one argued the point, and we certainly agree with that understanding. And then he said, on the other side, we look at farm markets, unstable, nothing that we can actually tie to in the farm credit circles that would assure us ability to repay or the producer's ability to repay. After the meeting was over, I got him off in the corner because I wanted to pursue this just a little. And I said to him, what is your position now come spring when the farmer and the rancher comes to you in farm credit circles for money operating capital? Well, he said, we're going to have to change our system. We can no longer go out and loan money to the farmer and rancher with inflated land values. We can no longer loan monies on current assets, machinery, but we're going to have to operate on a cash flow system. Now, this was a new approach to me, and I inquired a little further that I might understand it completely. And he said, the way it will work is this. When that farmer or that rancher comes to me or my field men and discusses operating loans, we will sit down and discuss the use of the money. And for example, if they decide then that the producer is going to plant 100 acres of corn, for example, that we'll take that 100 acres of corn, we'll 
calculate out the average production for that 100 acres over the last three or four years. And then we will multiply that times the current market. And that will be the cash flow that we can operate on. Well, if we operate on the cash flow with corn at 62% of value, $2, give or take a cent or two, this means then that with the high cost of producing assured and the ability to borrow based on current market, which is barely over 50% of parity, that you'll reduce the borrowing ability 50%. And if that borrowing ability is reduced 50%, then we, the farmer, will begin to figure out a way to cut costs that we can operate that year and hopefully the following. And we will cut the costs, no doubt, in the fertilizer field because it becomes an intangible something that you can't really see or feel. And if that borrowing practice is continued another year, the yield will be decreased and the ability to borrow will be reduced. And it will be like dominoes as they move toward the financing of agriculture. Another let it be known within the last few days that the deposits and the loan ratio in the banks across the country will not allow them to make available or have available the necessary funds to supply the needs come spring. And in their own words, there would have to be a massive insert, infusion, of monies available for agriculture. And in their own words, it can come from two sources. One would be from the government. Two, it could come from big companies who have the assets and the capabilities of borrowing. Consider the two. If it comes from the government, you have your first step towards socialized agriculture. If it comes from the big companies, you're now well on your road to vertical integration because they will loan the monies contingent on the return of supply through their facilities. I don't know what percent of farmers still control their own destiny, but it would be my guess 25, 30% have no ability to determine their own destiny because of financial ties today. Reports last night as we went into the wee hours of this morning in board meeting, and I tried to calculate and keep track, but I lost, the number of public reported farm sales and foreclosures. That now the media has let it be known because the farm credit structures have announced that this will be so. In the state of Nebraska, it runs in my mind 75 in four counties. Kansas reported almost identically. Yes, Dakota, they reported. And as I calculated mentally the numbers from the reports of four people was in excess of a hundred people. Well, we've got a problem to solve. We're here to outline the details of that program. And I want to assure you that we feel the urgency of it we feel the urgency that you portray. 
And we feel out there that we have some panic areas developing where they become anxious and rightfully so that something be done now. And in the process of becoming anxious for something to happen, maybe we overlook the more dangerous aspect of what may happen. Yes, we could take the 10% in this area, in this commodity that says it must be done now within a matter of weeks or months. We could take that 10% and go into battle and lose them. We could come back and in a week or so another area would relate the same position or condition to us and take those 10% and go into battle and lose them. Come back for another 10% in a few months and lose them, or we could take and restrain that 5 or 10 percent who feel the urgency while we get the second 10 and the third 10 until we get that 30 percent that we're talking about and then we go into the battle and we come out together. During the summer, uh, one afternoon, I went to one of my sheds and I opened the door. I was going to take out the auger and move some grain. And as the auger had been put away, a little grain had trickled down the tube and at the bottom there, I'm sure a few mice had found that and they had made a nest at the bottom, and at least I thought that's what it was. As I opened that door and stood there for just a few moments, I heard a buzz and it got louder and louder. And I immediately realized that I had invaded someone's territory and I wasn't about to run because I hadn't seen the forces yet. Now I've worked with the Yellow Jacket and the Hornet, but I've never been mixed up with a bumblebee before. And I stood and watched for just a moment as they began to come out. I took the little ball of fuzz and I gave it a throw out in the yard, away from the building. And I stood and watched that, and out they come one by one. After they got out, they began to circle, and they organized themselves, and they come. I had 100 yards to go. Well, I made the first 25, and one or two had made a pass at me. And as they made those passes, the others held back. They weren't coming totally together, but they come one or two at a time, and I don't know whether they went back and talked to the rest of them or not, but pretty soon here come 20 of them, and they come in a group, and I made my move. And as I approached that shop 100 yards away, I looked back, and the majority of them had given up the chase and gone back. And I had them strung out there for probably 50 yards, and they were singly coming after me. I stood my ground, and we had battle. Now, had they come, they had won, would have won if they had come together. But they didn't. They were going to take me one at a time. And so I won the battle. Now, let me assure you people, just as sure as you and I, think for a moment that we can divide our forces and in the process of doing this be successful. We're kidding ourselves. It will not work. It cannot work. We must eventually decide as a group which way we're going to go. And then as we make that decision, we go together. And when we say move left, we all move left. When we say right, by majority vote, two-thirds if you will, we all move right. We move forward and we move backward. Or we'll be picked off one by one. Yes, we have now in the offering a new Secretary of Agriculture in the weeks ahead. What can he do for us? Well, we expect a listening ear. I don't want anybody's sympathy. I want a listening ear. What can he do? 
He now serves under the present program chairman of the President's Agriculture Policy Committee. And he is totally overwhelmed by non-agriculture interests. And if he can be successful in convincing them of the role this industry is to play, he's got his hands full. What can we expect from the president? Well, we again expect a listening ear, not sympathy. What can he do? Can he appoint an agriculture-oriented background farm ranch man? The political pressures, industry, labor, commerce, will make it almost impossible for him to accomplish that goal. Consumer interest pressures, well, again I'm saying this is our problem. It's one that we must deal with. And it's awfully easy to blame someone else for our condition. And it's awfully easy to hope that someone else will solve it. But after you get all done weighing the pros and the cons, you come right back. And that's our problem. And we must deal with it. And anything short of we dealing with our problem to that degree, we will have betrayed this industry. We will have betrayed America. I don't know whether you and I are really ready for the battle that lies ahead. We have talked for some 20 years about it would be nice if we could announce the price, and our goal is there. It would be nice if we had cost of production contracts. We talked about it for 20 years. We now have the system, the mechanism, the physical facility and structure. Do you want to talk about it for 20 more years? I don't think we do. I think now we're ready. And we have the responsibility to give leadership, to give those of you in agriculture the chance to fight for what you think is right. And as we talk about the 30 percent and the solution with it, I can't help but run through my mind the steps that you have been talked to about so many times and not with any intent of repeating them, but going the next step, but so that you might follow me, begin at the beginning. We talk about the 30% and getting that together, and is there anyone that doesn't believe that 30% would do it? I do. The structure is there. The ability to be successful is there. That 30%, and then we have our county meetings and we decide contracts. We decide cost figures. And then we announce that that is where we're headed. We now have the strength, the determination to accomplish the goal. We announce to the industry that come X Monday morning, this will be the program. And I would hope that when that announcement is made, that industry will say, we understand your problems, that a contract will be forthcoming with those stipulations in it, but you know my good judgment tells me this won't happen. They will say to us, prove it. We don't believe you. The farmers have never stuck together to this point. What makes you think they will now? I'm sure will be industry's response. And so this means then they have challenged your program that you have put together. 
Now, you can begin to sell at that point. Move back into the old structure that you have always moved and operated in and lose everything that you have just put together through months and months of work. Or you can accept their challenge and refuse to deliver under what we refer to as the holding action. I would hope that our people are mentally and physically ready for such action because just as sure as we're here, it will happen. And this is the reason I say, are you ready for what has to be done? If you're not, we better back off because most assuredly this is where we're headed. All right, after you have the holding action, then the next step. How long do you become involved in this type of an action to be successful? I don't know. Depending on the percent of people you have involved to be successful. The more, of course, success will come more rapidly. But we do know this, that we have three to four days supply of milk after it leaves the dairy barn. We have seven to eight day's supply of meats after it leaves or after it's killed, after it leaves the farms and feedlots. But anyhow, during this period of time that we become involved in now, you will see a concerted effort by those within and without, and we would hope most all now would be within, participating in what we're involved in. You would see stocks begin to vanish from the shell. Instructions come to those in agriculture that they must start now to sell. In the form of an injunction or some other type of a legal document that we are begin to fill the channels with food and fiber in this country. If we did not and chose to violate then we would be in danger of legal action. And again I say, are you ready? Do you want to really price agriculture commodities with a profit? <laughs> do we want a price or do we want a profit? Every buyer has a price that he'll offer. Every company has a price that they will announce. You can get a price in nearly every sale. No profit. We have to make that decision. The top priorities now that are facing the country is the economy and where we're headed and how to solve it. Two suggestions. One is tax relief, which is only a temporary thing. In a matter of a few weeks or months, the effect would be lost. The other is consider the need for employment of people. Which industry, what industry, could employ people equal to agriculture? None. Do you know that we employ in agriculture one out of every five employable people in America? The 8%, 8 percent, 8.1 percent unemployment stability will never be experienced in this country until agriculture is recognized for what it is, the basic, the most vital industry in America, rather than the opinion that farmers are a product to be transported to a more profitable industry for employment. How do you employ people? How do you employ people? We employ more than steel, the automotive industry, and transportation 
all three combined, we employ more. How do you employ people? You look at the industry that has the ability to consume the most industrial goods. Who's the largest consumer of industrial goods in America? The farmer and the rancher. He could put more people back to work than all three of the industries combined if he had his buying power. What's the strength of his buying power today? Reports are that during the dark days of 1930, we had 80% of parity in agriculture. Now, this doesn't mean that we had a lot of money, but we had 80% of the buying power of the rest of the people. And do you know today we have only got 66%, the lowest since the 30s. Our buying power has been eroded. Our costs have simply consumed since 1950 increases of 288% increase in production costs. The graph will show that our costs are escalating up and our markets are deteriorating. And the margin between is getting larger and larger. Again, I believe in the divine destiny of this country and that the role of this organization is major in determining it. Now, people, if you're ready to do what has to be done, we will do what we can, but we can do nothing without you. The strength of NFO is out there in the counties and the states. And there's two things that you must do if we're to succeed. And you may not like either one of them, but you must do it. And what we do here may not be important, but what you do when you go home will have the impact. And this is two things you must do. You must organize your committees, your Minuteman structure in those counties, because physically there is no way that a department can do what has to be done in the country. No way. You must do it. Second, you must decide in your own mind now that industry is not going to compete within its own circle, agriculture, but that we are going to cause those outside of this industry to compete among themselves. And in order to do that, we unite ourselves and act as one with group action. And we yield some of our individual decision-making power to the point that as you move into markets, you no longer go as one. You go as one if you choose as far as the breed of cattle, the seed, the acreage, all phases of agriculture. But when you move to the market, you now operate in unison. And without those two factors, we'll be here next year talking about many of the same things we're talking about now, with some but no total victories. People, I'm ready. I'm ready to do my part. And I can assure you that the glamour of traveling extensively was lost after about two weeks. And after nine years, there's none left. The motels and the cafes have no attraction, as some may think. And I'll do my part just as long 
as you'll do yours. I'm confident that you will because you recognize the import of what we're doing. You have to make a decision whether you need an organization. And that decision must be made. And then you follow through and you project your goals for tomorrow. Do you have any for tomorrow? Do you have any for next week? Do you have any for next month? Do you have goals in your mind for next year? Do you know what you want to accomplish in your lifetime? If you don't, there's going to be a lot of slippage. Project in your mind what you want to accomplish and then start on your road. And I think we're headed. I think we're moving toward the goals that this organization had. Thank you, and it's good to visit with you. And I think we're ready. Thank you. President Staley, members of the Board of Directors, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to appear before you for a few moments to give an annual report on our activities in your Washington office. I should like to begin by telling you that first, uh, I've learned by some recent examples not to come out of Washington and try to tell a lot of jokes. I think it's kind of a dangerous way to make it. So. I don't have any today. I'm going to be very serious with you for just a few moments. I want to start by thanking those of you who have recently participated in the local political action and helped send back to Washington some members of the Congress that are friends of this organization, people with whom we work regularly. I'm sure that most of you know the members, you know who I'm talking about in those cases where we have good cooperation. Unfortunately, we may not have a few of them that do not fit in that category, but we'll forget about that for the moment. We've had a pretty good year considering all the problems that were up before this nation. We have a new president coming into the White House. He's a farmer. He's visited your Corning office. He knows this organization. He knows you're out here. We believe we can work with him. And we believe that we will have a little better atmosphere in which to work on farm program problems in the coming session of Congress. At that point, it's probably in order for me to point out to you one thing that we always try to keep in mind in our small office back there in Washington. The major responsibility, the major program of this organization is bargaining for farmers for better prices. In the Washington office, we understand that our role in the legislative field is entirely secondary to the main action of this organization out here in the country. And I hope you understand that. But thinking for the moment then of our responsibility in the legislative field, it perhaps would be a mistake to assume that all of our problems will automatically be handled back in Washington in the next 90 days, or for that matter, the next nine months or the next nine years because the country does face some tremendous problems, as Devon Woodland pointed out so well only a few moments ago. This country has some deep economic difficulties with which to deal. They have 
the challenge of more inflation to deal with. They have unemployment in the cities. We have the problem of presenting, as well as we can, the place of the farmers in our national economy and dealing with those issues that pertain directly to the survival of the Capra Volstead Act, the goals of this organization, and what we may do in the form of farm programs that serve as a backup to your main effort in bargaining so that we may set farmers' prices without depending on Washington. Now, in the sense of dealing with a backup type of farm program, I would remind you that there's one good illustration of the challenge before any of us, not just our office, but any of us working in Washington to represent the farm people of this country. There are only 22 congressional districts of the 435 members in the House of Representatives where the people on the farms represent more than 16% of the votes. Of those 22 districts, 11 are Democrats, 11 are Republicans, and it is at least some consolation to be able to report to you that all of them but two normally cooperate with us very well on the issues with which we deal in the Congress. Now, we had some success in the 94th Congress. We passed a better farm bill in the spring of 1975. It was vetoed, but it set a precedent for us. It shaped up the setting, if you please, with which we will be dealing in the new Congress. They passed a tax bill with some worthwhile changes pertaining to the various taxes that come into play when the farm moves from one generation to the next. The inheritance tax provisions are a little complicated to discuss quickly, and I won't try to. But we did get some improvements in that tax bill. And as you, if you have to face up to these problems, home in your own families, I think you'll find there are some substantial help to you as compared to what we had before this bill was passed. We were able to defeat or bottle up, if you please, a bill that started in the Judiciary Committee. It was labeled as antitrust legislation. It had a provision in it authorizing and directing the FTC and the Department of Justice to look into the authorities, the provisions of the Capra-Volstead Act, the umbrella authority under which bargaining and cooperative associations operate in this country. Through the actions of a number of people in Washington, we were able to keep it from ever coming out of committee. Now, that's a little hard to put up on the scoreboard, but I hope you keep in mind in our daily and weekly activities in there, sometimes your best accomplishment is to stop something you don't want, just as it is to promote or push for legislation that's favorable or something that you think would help you. But without spending too much time on the past, let's talk a little about where we go from here. I'm sure all of you have watched various types of coalitions operating in legislative field at both the state level and the national level. Whether it's a matter involving the oil companies, the railroads, the professional fields, or otherwise, most major legislation that moves in this day and age moves as a result of coalition activity. It has become, in these modern times, almost impossible for one organization to sponsor, draft, work with, and move a bill of any consequence without having 
cooperation of other agencies or other organizations with whom you're working. We spend a good deal of our time staying in touch with the people in church organizations, consumer organizations, environmental groups, people of that sort who are interested in our problems or interested in knowing more about how we operate out here on the farms and the current day costs of operation. They want to know more about the origin of food and why we have the problems that we have in pricing these food products we send to town. Now along that same line, of course, we have our own NFO legislative program. It's based on the national resolutions that you pass each year in this convention. And the advice that I'm able to get on a weekly basis, so to speak, from the leadership in Corning. But we're also active in a coalition of about 35 farm and commodity organizations in this country. Last week, we had our first small leadership meeting in which we talked about the program that we might have before us starting in January. I think you might be interested just in the highlights of our discussion. Keeping in mind that also that in a recent survey that I made with the leadership of this organization, I found better than 74% favorable to the continuation of a farm program in this country. Now with that base of operation, We've concluded, for the moment at least, that we'd like to have the next bill written on a four or five year basis. We'd like to get away from the context in which you have to wait every year or every 18 months to see what the next support level is going to be if you're doing a little planning on your own crops and in your own activities. We, of course, want to retain the non-recourse loan concept that we've had throughout the history of these farm programs on both grains and cotton. We want to increase the price support level on manufacturing milk. I was pleased that this group of leaders representing a wide-ranging number of organizations, cotton, peanuts, wheat, feed grains, dairy, across the board, are all thinking along the lines of relating the price support levels to the cost of production. I believe we're over that hump. I believe the understanding we have among those working with us from other organizations is due in no small part to your activities right out here in the country where we've talked about the need for cost of production and a profit for so long. We're beginning to get some returns on it. We've got good response on it with the congressional committees. We think we need to continue some type of index or escalator provision that will move these price supports with changes in the cost of farming from year to year. We had it in the old bill. We want it in the next one. We want to retain a disaster program provision. Those of you who have suffered out here in this drought area recently know that the provisions were not perfect. They did not work too well, but they nevertheless at least put 40, 50 million dollars each into the states like North Dakota, Minnesota, and some of the places where you've been hit so hard the last year or two. We want to improve it, and we want to continue the provision. We want to reaffirm the farm stored loan concept. Now, it won't come as any news to you to talk about the problem of what is commonly referred to as a reserve, a 
of commodities in this country. You may have all variety of expressions. Some people want a strategic reserve. Some people want an international reserve. Some of them who talk about a reserve wouldn't know the first thing to do if somebody told them to make plans to move and store and take care of five million bushel of grain. They wouldn't even know where to start. But they're talking a lot about it. And they're doing so because they are legitimately concerned about knowing that there is some adequate supply to reassure the public against real shortage in the case of widespread drought in one of the major producing countries of the world. Now, without standing up here and undertaking to tell you that I know all the answers, I certainly do not. I would try to give you this reassurance. Some of us have said to the members of the Congress with whom we work, in the first place, you can't have any reserve until you produce more than the market wants at any particular time. And when we overproduce one of these markets, as we may very well now do in the coming year if we have good weather, then the farmers will be interested in seeing the production that's excess to the current need set aside, stored, held off the market, and maintained for such use as we may have of it one, two, three years down the road. I think in the long term, the people of the world can use all our production. The problem will be how to handle the excess on the short term run, the two or three year periods when we overproduce and have a chance for prices to go through the floor we have to have a means of holding that excess production on a temporary basis so it will not break everybody and push us all into bankruptcy out here in the grain farms. I like to think of doing it by holding that grain back in farm storage under one, two, three year loan as may be appropriate and keep it there where it can be kept in the best condition where it can be moved in any direction in which it is needed and where the farmer has a chance to make a profit on it if we get the market back up and have a place to put it two or three years down the road. That's what we're trying to get on. We will ex support extension of the PL 480 program. That little fancy number refers to a long-standing authority. It's been on the books about 20 years. It provides the authority and the money to move some of these commodities out to poor people in some countries of the world where they do not have much and where they perhaps do deserve some consideration from the more fortunate nations that have money or grain to use. It's currently supported by several nations of the world who are in position to do so. We will support extension of the food stamp program. It got in a lot of controversy in the last Congress. The Senate passed a bill. The House could not get an agreement. They worked on it for months and finally laid the whole mess aside. They'll take it up in the first part of next year. It might surprise you to know that some of us want it in a package with the farm bill because when we put the food stamp program and the farm bill on the table as one package, we've got an interest from those members in the Congress who are in New York City, Chicago, Milwaukee, Los Angeles, and so on across the country. It's not always just a matter of writing something and making a speech to get these things through the Congress. There's one other aspect that I would try to describe quickly for you because I know that most good farm people are just as concerned about the red ink budgets and the what appears to be excessive spending by the federal government from time to time. We've been running at the rate 
of about $75 billion a year in increasing our debt. In fact, when you think about this, I don't know why Jimmy Carter or anybody else wants to be president. It's going to be a hell of a mess to deal with, I can tell you. But he's faced with it nevertheless. Now, one thing was done. The Congress, in an effort to strengthen their own responsibility to control the appropriations of money in our government, a couple of years ago, passed some new budgetary control legislation. They set up their own committee, their own staff of experts. They've got an office now that they can hold responsible to work their own budget procedures rather than just to have to depend on the executive branch to write up a package and bring it to them. What it means to you is this. Under their rules, any new farm bill that's to be passed next year and to be applicable in 1977 crops has to be reported out of the committee at least by March 1 if not reported out, it must be in a package form so that the agriculture committees can tell the budgetary group what it will cost and get it fitted into the overall budget that will be established by the Congress. This new procedure means that those of us who are working in farm legislation now face a more difficult challenge or competition, if you please, from other segments of the economy, all of them are going to be fighting for their share of a rather tight budget control that will be established early in the year. So whatever we do on a farm bill will have to be shaped up through old February to middle or late March. I think you'll see it move pretty fast. In closing, I should like to at least undertake to express a thought that I've brought to your annual convention in times in the past. I hope you'll bear with me. Considering our responsibilities in the Washington office, we deeply appreciate the help you give us by staying in touch with, by being acquainted with, and working with the members of Congress who represent your districts. I don't care whether they're Democrat or Republican. I hope you're talking to them. I hope you're acquainted with them. We work with the people in both parties. I hope that as you do talk to them, you're able to keep the goals, and the programs of this organization foremost in your visits or your concerns, in your relationship with your senators and your members of the House. I urge you, don't be used Take an advantage of, if you please, by others who may come down the pike with their little pet projects and undertake to enroll 